Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, Saskia gave me a topic that I, I have to do in, in uh, 20 minutes, and each just each topic deserves a, a 20 minute discussion. So at the end of the day, um, the questions about when to choose your treatments, etc. I think it's very it's a very sensitive issue, and that really needs to be discussed personally with your uh, fertility specialist. So, you know, again, what is the definition of a family? And, and uh, it's a group of one or more parents and their children living together um, as a unit. So, you know, that, that can be, you know, if we talk of the old days, uh, a family was, uh, you know, a husband and a wife. And uh, at the end of the day, you had your children and everyone got on with it. And, and just the thought, thought of uh, the mother-in-law thinking, differently, you know, that perhaps we would come, come home in the same sex relationship or etc. And, and, you know, we've, we've, we've developed and, and the world has changed. And yes, um, if, we, if we look at what South African law says, and this I'm going to leave to Andrew, and, and what the, the definition of a family is, and, and the traditional nuclear family form is based on the relationship of a married man and a woman and their biological and adopted children. Um, does not reflect the reality of, of our society and not necessarily our society. I think uh, every society throughout our planet. And at least the Children's Act uh, 2005 um, said that parents need to care for a child, we need to keep contact with the child, we need to act as a guardian of the child, and we need to contribute towards the maintenance of a child. If we, if we look at the trends of what's happening in the world today, and uh, this shows us exactly that if we look at the green uh, aspect of the slide, that's really uh, from the UK, from the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And in 2000, if we look at same-sex female couples, they went up from 471 cases in 2000 to 4,750 cases of treatment cycles in 2018. Um, so, and if we look all around, if you look in America, for instance, the use of, of donor sperm by same-sex female couples has increased to 20% after the legalization of same-sex marriages. And, uh, you know, we, we, we had a similar problem in this country, and I don't believe there's any fertility clinics here that would stand on the or put their last strand on the fact that before 1997 we didn't go underground and artificially inseminate unmarried women um, we did you know uh, it, it, it uh, we, we we continued you know we're, we're health professionals and we're there to help people and uh, yeah we could have got into trouble but uh, if we didn't help the couples they were going to get help irrespective you know they were going to do their thing about it and uh, we know we had pictures in the newspaper of a woman running down Norwood Grant Avenue with a champagne cup a glass with a with a ejaculate in it, and then off she went and did her, as they called it in the newspaper, turkey basting, and uh, she she managed to do artificial insemination by just putting that sperm from the champagne cup into her partner's vagina, um, and. Our, our unit started uh, back in 85 and I only joined it towards the end of 89. And um, the, the biggest thing that hit the, the press was the, uh, the grandmother who carried her own grandchildren. And uh, they came from Limpopo and there you can see the mother who herself had had a caesarean hysterectomy, which is something that happens today, which is often uh, a good indication for surrogacy. And uh, this granny was 49 years old and she carried her triplets. Uh, our unit was involved in this and we had the press and the BBC and, and everybody else. Um, I, was, I was still a registrar in those days. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, as I say, the, a very big moment for South Africa because uh, surrogacy was only in the world starting to get off the ground. And uh, the last thing you wanted is this poor 49-year-old granny to be carrying triplets, which is obviously a very important issue when uh, one is pregnant. And uh, you don't want to overload someone who's older who may be a, an older surrogate. So you want to be careful today and look at only putting one embryo back if possible. 
But things changed for us in 97 when um, a same-sex female couple presented themselves to the Constitutional Court. And after that, it was legal for us to artificially inseminate single females or unmarried females, which, which changed the horizon for us because then we didn't have to go underground. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, a, a lot more pleasurable working under those circumstances. If we, you know, artificial insemination is, is something that one can apply either to single males or typically to same-sex female couples. And we can utilize known sperm or unknown donor sperm. Known sperm is a, is a whole different ball game, and Andrew, I hope, will go into that with regards to rights to the, uh, the, the child and the upbringing of that child in relation to the fact that you now have a known donor, whereas the uh, donors are themselves protected uh, from an anonymous point of view. Um, some, some recipient couples want to be able to, for, their, for their offspring to actually meet their donors later on, and that's one of the reasons why we use a lot of American sperm um, because the couples can choose via um, the profiles of the donors of whether they are willing to meet um, the, the offspring um, that has been achieved by using their donor sperm. And that is when the child reaches the age of 18. Um, we can then artificially inseminate uh, in the lab and do IVF or we can do intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And again, then that would come into play rather when we are talking about surrogacy or we are dealing with reproductively older uh, single females or same sex couples where you need to get them preg pregnant sooner rather than later. And one would then be forced to use artificial uh, assisted reproductive technology. So again, they're the same thing, you know, your own gametes. And again, will it be uh, one of the females eggs? And we have these um, various different permutations where the one would like to give the eggs. I'm just now talking about same sex female couples and uh, the other one will be the carrier. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, that, that is all legal. And it's just the issue of if there's a known donor as to, in, I'm talking about from the sperm point of view, um, what the legalities are. And then from a surrogacy point of view, um, we do surrogacy often purely for women who've had the uterus removed, uh, especially at the time of a Caesar. And they have one child and they are obviously the only way of enlarging their families via surrogate. Um, and also then typically for same-sex male couples. And fortunately, we have Michael today, who's obviously going to broaden out on that. And there again, depending on circumstances, one can use donor eggs. And uh, from a surrogacy point of view in our country, um, one of the commissioning couple have to contribute uh, one of the gametes. So it's either... Uh, the, if, if it's a same-sex male couple, we use donor eggs and one of the male sperm. And uh, if it's a same-sex female couple, um, one of the eggs have to be used. You cannot use donor eggs and we can't do surrogacy for a single woman. Um, so at the end of the day, it is quite complicated and the legal things, you would then obviously seek help from a person like Andrew, who's a fertility lawyer. You know, we're fertility specialists, we're not fertility lawyers. And uh, we, we try and steer clear of that because our job is to achieve the pregnancies and not to get involved with the uh, law and uh, at the end of the day stuck in litigation that we don't quite understand. So if we look at surrogacy in South Africa, um, we, we, we look at criteria and yeah, sometimes you're stuck because surrogates are, are, you don't pick them off trees on the one hand. On the other hand, you, you know, there, there's certain characteristics that one would be looking for and the age is somewhere between 21 and 42, although that's not a limit. I mean, we could take a 45 year old or 46 year old provided she's healthy and uh, they need to have obviously good health. And if they are in the older age bracket, we would send them off to a physician to get a clean bill of health. Um, the surrogate has to be a South African citizen and has to have at least one child of her own. Um, uh, the surrogate preferably should be employed, not absolutely, it's ideal, and uh, should be able to show financial independence. Um, the surrogate would undergo medical screening, she will need to be seen by a fertility specialist, uh, obviously the necessary work, and then one, she would need psychological screening. Um, if we look at the criteria for the commissioning couple, the couple need to domicile in South Africa. Um, the surrogacy by right is not allowed for foreigners. 
And, uh, you know, with uh, fertility uh, today and transporting gametes and eggs and sperm and embryos in dry shippers outside of the country is something that one can do. And then the embryos can be transferred in a fertility clinic in their home country. So, again, th there, there's certain areas which become loopholes. And uh, I'd leave that one for Andrew to comment on. But we would be careful not to do foreigners in our country unless, as I say, they have proven uh, that they domicile here and they have South African citizenship. Um, we, as I said, you have to use at least one of the commissioning couple's gametes and uh, medically incapable of carrying their own child. And that, that can be very broad, okay, um, as to what the reasons would be and why they can't carry their own child. It could be for psychological reasons, it could be for medical reasons, it could be because they don't have a uterus, or it could be where they've done numerous IVFs with recurrent implantation failure and we now need another oven. We have our own egg, bo uh, egg bank. Uh, we did start, we, we, we felt that it was prudent to only start putting eggs in the freezer when we could document that the technology that we were using was robust. And uh, we started with robust technology in 2013. And when we had a functioning egg bank, we would then actually advise patients to come and use the frozen eggs. And we were getting pregnancies very much the same as fresh eggs. So unfortunately, there are lots of eggs sitting in uh, liquid nitrogen dewars having been frozen before technology was robust. And those patients are only finding out now that unfortunately, those eggs have not survived and, 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 and they, they, you know, they, they become nothing. You can't really use them. Now and again, we'll slip through with, a, with an egg that may be able to survive and give a baby, but the majority of eggs prone, uh, frozen prior to 2013 uh, really, or, or, or they come to naught. Um, the donors that we use are between the age of 18 and 32. They need a matric. Um, their BMI has to be 29 or less. Um, obviously, all race groups and nationalities, we check them for drugs. They screen medically, they screen psychologically, and they have the relevant counseling. We have a, um, a, a program on the computer where we give the patients an opportunity to actually look at these donor profiles in the comfort of their own home and then uh, choose accordingly. Donors are not allowed to have more than six live births, and that includes their own children. And then it costs somewhere between 60 and 135,000 for the whole thing, cycle of treatment, including the eggs and the IVF, for the uh, couple who are going, the recipient couple of the donor eggs. From a sperm donation point of view, um, we also uh, have a, a small lab. There, there are lots of other labs within the country. Um, there's some in Joburg, Cape Town, uh, uh, Stellenbosch. Um, and uh, the reason why we use uh, overseas sperm donors is that firstly, uh, the variety is amazing. You get a lot more information on who the donors are. And um, at the end of the day, there, as I say, some patients would like to know that they can introduce their children later on to the donor. Um, we do use known sperm donors, again, with the necessary consent. Uh, it's not just taken and used, because if you don't have the legal issues as to how that, what is the rights of that father um, to that child when there is no real family connection, and, and that we use, our clinic assesses that, and obviously we need the legal documentation to proceed. Donors are not allowed to have more than 12 live births in this country, and at the end of the day, the price range per straw, local is somewhere in the region of three grand, and uh, if we're bringing in sperm from overseas, it's about 15,000 rand per straw. And one straw, if we're doing IVF, is uh, more than enough for a few cycles of IVF. If, if we're doing ICSI with that one straw, we've got more than enough to work with. And at the end of the day, it, it's not that costly. Um, as far as what we're addressing today, um, this group of patients is growing, as I showed you in the initial slide. We know the World Health Organization defines 52 different genders. And um, at the end of the day, there's a lot of research and, and, and resources, okay, specifically for our LGBTQ2S plus group. And uh, you can look down where that arrow goes to Queering Parenthood. There's the email address, uh, or not email, the website address. Uh, and that's www.queeringparenthood.com for anyone who wants to go there. And there's a lot of research now showing that unfortunately, 
um, a lot of these couples, especially when they are undergoing transgender uh, uh, change, there, there's a problem in that a lot of them are not counseled correctly. And today, if we look at studies in Belgium and Western Europe, at least up to 77% of them want to put their gametes away in storage. And what's important is obviously to do that prior to hormone therapy or surgery or in conjunction with those procedures. So our options for persons with testicles would be obviously sperm banking, and our options for persons with ovaries would be egg banking, embryo banking, or even ovarian tissue freezing. So, we are, are quite proud that we do help these families and we've been helping them for many years in assisting their fertility treatment. We, we have very supportive medical staff. Uh, there's nobody there that judges anybody at the end of the day and uh, it's regardless of marital status or sexual orientation. And uh, we understand that uh, you know the, the fertility options are they difficult for these patients and, and there needs to be the necessary backup. And uh, we have comp created a comprehensive fertility program that encompasses the medical, financial, legal and emotional obstacles that um, these couples face. And finally, um, and, uh, when I asked Callista to just tidy up my slides for me, she said, do you want a funny slide at the end or do you want a, a real serious slide? So I said, no, let's have a funny slide. So thank you, guys. And on the right, that's a really old picture of me. Thank you.